Welcome everybody to this evening's Intellectual Forum event. It's great to have you here at Jesus College, uh, at least virtually. My name is Julian Huppert, I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus, uh, which you can see behind me in, in, in sunnier times. Um, and we are recording this event for anybody who can't make it. So the Intellectual Forum was set up four years ago to get people thinking. We've had many stellar speakers from fashion designer Jimmy Chu, former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark, director of NASA's Deep Space X-ray Observatory Belinda Wilkes, and we've also shown off some of the transformational work being done by many of our own academics, from using synthetic biology to come up with a new, safe, clean way of dyeing clothes, to experiments with the coldest things in the universe, colder even than outer space. One of our very first events was to mark the inauguration of Donald Trump four years ago. We had lots of students and staff and academics who were, frankly, somewhat traumatized, wanted to understand what had happened. How did he win and what could we expect to happen next? We held a panel to address that, including a political scientist, a US specialist, and a very experienced professor of psychoanalysis. Although I think the event captured a number of the historic drivers, you know, how could somebody like Trump win? And we correctly forecast some of the oddities that would happen. I'm not sure we correctly predicted everything that, could, that happened over what has been a really tumultuous and bizarre four years. This time, the atmosphere is somewhat different, but we wanted nonetheless to reflect on the last four tumultuous years and try to understand what to expect next. So that's the essay question for tonight's speaker. Nothing short of a complete explanation and prediction. Fortunately, we have a real expert on hand, Patrick Davies, the former Deputy British Ambassador to the US. And I'm really grateful to Bridget Gildea, one of our senior research associates here at the IF for persuading him to speak. And in a moment, I'll hand her over uh, I'll hand over to her to introduce him. Now, Bridget used to be Chief of Staff in the British Consulate General in Boston, as well as having directorial roles at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Royal Society of Medicine, as well as much else. We're delighted to have her with us now. But first, just a quick word on how we'll run this. We'll hear from Patrick, and then I'll take questions from you, the audience, using the Q&A feature in Zoom, which you should be able to see on your screen, although I can't promise that we'll get through them all please do feel free to tweet throughout using at Intel Forum and at Paddy J Davies. I hope you'll enjoy this event and find much to think about as well. I also hope you'll sign up for our other events. We have lots coming up. And now, Bridget, over to you. Thank you so much, Julian, um, for that fantastic welcome. And I think it's probably worth saying that the seeds of this conversation go back to a conversation that Julian and I both had in 2000, the year 2000. Um, so we'll think less about how long it's been since then. Um, so I'm delighted to be here this evening and very excited to see um, more of the IF events as it goes along. Thank you from both Patrick and me to the entire IF team for putting this event on. Um, and we're looking forward to kind of delving into the conversation. So it falls to me to introduce Patrick, um, Patrick Davis, as we said, OBE. So Patrick was um, the DHM, so the Deputy Head of Mission, aka the Deputy Ambassador, um, to multiple places before he came to the States, including Iran. And I remember meeting Patrick um, on his uh, entry into the US network, which is over 700 staff throughout the US, um, not just the kind of embassy in DC, but also covering all aspects and regions of America. And when Patrick came into the States, it was immediately clear, not only was he an extremely skilled um, and highly decorated diplomat, but also he had a take on the States that was refreshing, new, um, and he intuitively understood that rather than just kind of thinking about America as a conglomerate of the larger states, um, the way that we tend to think about it uh, from abroad, he was very interested in actually getting under the skin um, of all of the different parts of America, all of the different cultures, all of the different regions, potentially even different climates, and particularly how uh, the kind of dispersed political power in the states worked. And I think that led to um, you know, huge success in terms of the run up to the 2016 election, um, and also contributed towards uh, his book, which if you haven't bought it already, you absolutely should, called The Great American Delusion. Um, I will be asking him questions, whoops, sorry. I'll be asking him questions from this book um, at the end of his remarks, um, but it falls to me now to ask Patrick for his entirely expert opinion on what just happened and what's going to happen next. 
Well, first and foremost, thank you, Bridget, and th thank you, uh, Julian, for, for inviting me to the Intellectual Forum and to Jesus College. Um, I hope one day we'll be able to do this in person again rather than, than remotely from here in Cheshire, but it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you and be with everybody who's um, dialing in from, from the UK and around the world. Um, what I wanted to do um, in answering your exam question, if you like, is, is, is start um, with the positives. And, and you know, I think there are, there are a lot of them. The first being that in um, Joe Biden, um, the United States has just elected, uh, just inaugurated a hugely experienced and committed public servant as their 46th president. And alongside him, uh, Kamala Harris, um, not only is she an impressive and talented individual in her own right, she's also now the first woman and also the first black woman to be vice president in the United States. So just in that, I think um, the, the inauguration this afternoon brings a sense of hope and positive change and indeed calm and competent leadership returning to the United States, which when uh, we see all the challenges the US is facing, but also the challenges that we all are um, uh, confronting at the moment in a global pandemic, those are sentiments and feelings that I think are really, really important. If we look back a few months as well to the period running up to the, the November presidential election, um, uh, all the polling outside the US um, suggested that the vast majority of people, certainly in the Western world, were uh, rooting for a Biden victory. Very few people um, were, uh, wanted to see uh, Donald Trump uh, get another four years in the White House. So in thinking about um, this conversation this evening, I was sort of imagining the sentiment, if you like, if rather than Joe Biden being inaugurated this afternoon, it had been Donald Trump having another term in office. And, you know, there would have been raucous celebrations um, beamed to us uh, on our TVs from um, uh, Trump supporters across America and indeed in other parts of the world in their Make America Great Again hats uh, and partying. Um, but I also think there would have been some delight in Moscow and Beijing as well, that uh, an unusual, shall we say, uh, president was going to be back in office and all that came with that. But I think amongst a majority of people in the Western world, and indeed many millions of Americans, there would be a sense of real anxiety, of fear and, and dread even of, of what the next four, four years was going to mean. From my perspective, having, having worked closely with the Trump administration in their first year or so in office, I have no doubt that another four years of Trump would have been extremely damaging for America, but also extremely damaging for the rest of the Western world too. Um, we all know the strap line, make America great again. That's what Donald Trump promised to do. And, you know, he's in reality done very little of the sort. Now, to give credit where credit's due, for the first um, two or three years of the Trump presidency, the economy in, an, in the US continued to grow strongly. Um, and indeed, he delivered tax cuts. And those were to all Americans, even if the majority of them were to the wealthiest. And, in, and of course, that, that racked up a significant amount of debt that the US will have to pay back in future. He changed the American approach to China, um, you know, flagging something that we'd all known for quite some time that China hadn't been playing by the rules. It had been stealing Western intellectual property to gain economic advantage. And, and Trump took a different approach to that. Now, we can argue about whether his tactics worked, and personally, I don't think they did, but he wasn't wrong in um, addressing those issues. But apart from that, what we saw in Donald Trump was him, him pouring, pouring gasoline on the flames of divisions in America. He pitched American against American when they had a different perspective or view. And he constantly played on people's fears, fears about their jobs, their personal security, of growing diversity in the US. 
And you know, internationally, he picked fights with allies too, uh, whether that was NATO, uh, whether that was um, over climate change, whether that was um, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, um, in, and whether it was trade, uh, and indeed on China too. And broadly speaking, there was a sense that Donald Trump let hostile powers off the hook rather too much. He, he sort of had a strange attraction to dictators and despots, and in some ways to them more than he did to America's closest allies. Donald Trump also promised to drain the swamp, but in fact, he, he filled it with all sorts of dubious people. You know, his first national security advisor, Michael Flynn, lasted just a few weeks and was later found uh, to be uh, or convicted of, uh, by the FBI of, of lying uh, about his connections with Russia. Steve Bannon, um, his strategist in chief, um, basically, uh, you know, um, a, a white nationalist, uh, again, fell out with the Trump administration within a few, few first few months but more recently was charged with fraud and money laundering. Now, both those uh, individuals have been pardoned by Trump in recent weeks, as we know. Kellyanne Conway, um, Trump's propagandist in chief, if you like, um, who um, gave us the term alternative facts and who never missed an opportunity to defend Donald Trump, however removed from reality that was. Uh, the Attorney General William Barr, who in his rather unquestioning loyalty to Donald Trump, um, did a lot to undermine the independence of the, the US judiciary. Now, he did stand back a little bit from that in the last few weeks because he disagreed with Donald Trump over the, the claims of a stolen election. But, you know, quite a lot of damage had already been done. And then perhaps most recently and most famously, Rudy Giuliani, um, uh, Donald Trump's uh, chief camp counsel, who was embroiled in the Ukraine affair that got John Donald Trump impeached for the first time. And of course, very recently has been peddling wild um, allegations of uh, uh, voter irregularities and a stolen election, which are simply untrue. You know, the fact is, there wasn't really a swamp to drain in Washington, D.C. Of course, all administrations have had their characters who, um, who may or may not be dubious. But, you know, he went about um, building a very large swamp and filling it with all sorts of people who you would not normally expect to be in positions of power in one of the uh, uh, largest democracies in the world. Now, you know, as a former diplomat, I really don't say these things lightly. We are not normally ones for hyperbole. Uh, indeed, we are um, uh, advised against it much of the time. But I genuinely think it's hard to exaggerate how damaging the consequences would have been for both America and the Western world if we were now facing four more years of Trump. You know, just imagine Trump with a free hand in his tech second term, feeling even more emboldened, unleashed, if you like. You know, that over the last four years, very few Republicans have tried to constrain him. Very few people have distanced themselves for, from him, despite you know, the white nationalism, despite the attacks on the free press, despite the attacks on the rule of law, despite the fact that Donald Trump and his family have enriched themselves through his office, despite the constant lying. I think there's a tally now of several tens of thousands of examples of Trump blatantly lying, despite his fraternizing with QAnon and other conspiracy theories, despite the Ukraine scandal, which we talked about when he um, tried to get a foreign country to help him win an election, which is illegal, and despite him being caught red-handed, handing intelligence to the Russians. So, you know, and even the storming of the Capitol in the last two weeks, only 10 Republicans out of more than 200 in the House of Representatives voted for that impeachment. Um, you know, it's pretty shocking. I found that pretty shocking um, that a sitting president um, incites insurrection 
in the United States, and only 10 Republicans managed to uh, vote uh, for his impeachment. After that, it still came down to party politics. Imagine too, if you like, um, an emboldened Donald Trump internationally. We would have seen more America first, more undermining of multilateral institutions, which have helped to keep us all safe for the last 70 plus years, greater divergence from allies, I think, on everything from climate change to Iran again, human rights on trade, and potentially more cozying up to uh, dictators. Uh, America's reputation uh, could only have suffered the, um, from that, uh, uh, you know, another four years of Trump and its ability to act as a force for good in the world would have been greatly diminished. So those old empires who don't have Western interests at heart and emerging powers would have been emboldened too because they would have known that there was little real pushback against their activities because there was no credible international US leadership. Now, I promised that this part, part of the talk was about the positives. Um, so uh, let's talk about some positives. You know, Donald Trump didn't win a second term, um, despite what um, uh, Donald Trump uh, continues to say. He won um, by 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. Almost uh, Donald Trump won by almost exactly the same numbers four years ago and called those a landslide. Um, Biden won by more than um, the popular vote by more than 7 million, the largest margin ever. And yes, of course, Donald Trump, because of great turnout in this election, uh, got the highest number of votes at 74 million for the losing candidate, but he still lost. So in um, the Biden and Harris administration, I genuinely believe there's, there's a chance to right the ship. Um, there's a chance we can return to normality, if you like, um, and that is where experience and expertise are valued, where we, where we return to a more calm and rational form of policy making and leadership. If you look at the people um, Joe Biden in the transition period has nominated for very senior positions in the administration, they're hugely experienced and talented. Um, many of them um, served in the Obama administration and in even the Clinton admin administration too. But I think more than them being experienced and talented, and I, you know, I've met quite a few of them um, uh, for the three years I was working with the Obama administration. And this might sound a bit of a sort of schmaltzy thing to say, but they're really good and decent people. So the likes of Tony Blinken as Secretary of State, Alejandro Mayorkas, who will head Homeland Security, Bill Burns at the CIA, Janet Yellen at Treasury, um, Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the UN, Samantha Power at USAID. These are not egos. These are not people who want gratification personally or have political ambitions for themselves. These are hard-working, decent public servants who I genuinely believe are going to work hard for what's best for America. And we haven't really seen very much of that over the last four years. Internationally too, when we look at it from the UK and elsewhere, I think we're getting a more predictable and a more reliable partner in the Biden administration. You know, we've all seen already that they plan to rejoin the um, uh, Paris Accord and redouble America's efforts to work both domestically and internationally to tackle climate change, which Biden himself uh, uh, on, uh, in his inauguration speech defined as an existential threat. That America is going to rejoin the World Health Organization. And I'm, I think we will see much greater global leadership now to tackle the coronavirus pandemic, something that's been sadly lacking for the last year. We are going to see um, uh, the US reconnect with its allies in NATO and elsewhere. We'll see attempts to um, make a new deal with Iran to stop them um, pressing forward with their um, nuclear weapon ambitions. And I think we'll see on China, for example, as I said before, I don't think we'll see a significant 
recalibration of the policy overall, but I'll, you will see Biden trying to work with allies, building um, uh, uh, groups of countries to work together to put pressure on China to do the right thing. So, you know, I think we can breathe genuinely, we can breathe a collective sigh of relief today. Um, uh, Biden brings a sense of hope, he brings a sense of positive change, it's a forward-looking agenda if you listen to his speech this afternoon, and I think, you know, we will see America try to re-establish its place in the world as a global leader. Um, you know, I think also we can take comfort um, from the fact that the US withstood such an assault on its democracy, not just two weeks ago, but over the last four years, um, its institutions have survived. Some have been pretty scarred in the process and it may have come close at times, but America did survive. And that's a positive thing because it was, pretty, it was a pretty serious test of American uh, democracy. So, you know, there's lots to be positive about today, but before we get carried away, I think we do need to talk about some of the challenges Biden and his administration are going to face. And, and some of them are obvious, though, and, and those are going to be the top priorities for his administration. And that is, first and foremost, dealing with the pandemic, trying to get on top of, of how that is uh, impacting uh, the whole of America, and indeed the economic crisis that it has caused. And that's going to take up a huge amount of bandwidth of the new administration for months, if not years. America, uh, like Britain, has had a pretty bad pandemic and the economic implications are quite grave. Um, so there's a lot to do, but then Biden and his administration are already focusing on that, promising to vaccinate 100 million people in 100 days, mandating, mandating the wearing of masks in federal institutions and so on, to try and get on top of the pandemic. But it's only part of the story, I'm afraid, and um, Brid Bridget was kind enough to reference my book, The Great American Delusion, um, uh, when she uh, did her introdu introduction. And what I argue um, really in a nutshell in, in the book is that America has been blinded by myths of its, of its exceptionalism um, for a long time. And as a result of that, has not tackled some really fundamental flaws in the American system. And those are political, they're economic, and they're social. And what's happened because those, those issues have not been tackled is that you've seen increased divisions in American society. You've seen a politics increasingly poisoned and uh, partisan. And you know ultimately, it's sort of accelerated American decline as a global power. And, and you know, that's clearly bad for America, but it's bad for the Western world too, in my view. Now, you know, looking back, it would be very easy to blame Donald Trump for all this, but Trump was a symptom of those problems, not the cause. Um, you know, he, the failure to tackle the problems, the fundamental problems I mentioned, led to an environment where a demagogue and a brash and un, you know, varnished guy like Donald Trump could take the very highest office in the land by using a populist playbook, by whipping up fears of, of um, individual Americans, fears that are genuine, but um, he was able to come to power on the back of those problems. He's not the, he didn't cause those problems himself himself now he didn't spend any time trying to resolve these issues during his presidency instead he exacerbated them to um, uh, to, to whip up his base um, it was a sort of angry and reckless form of government if you like that exploited the fears of working class Americans and evangelicals and told them that, you know, if you were slightly on the left, you were a socialist and you were going to destroy America. If you were uh, a person of faith, that your religious freedoms would be taken away if, if anybody other than Donald Trump was in power. But despite all that, and despite his approach to government, he still wasn't the cause of the fundamental problems that America faces. So him leaving office 
will almost certainly reduce the noise and the chaos and the anger in American politics, but it doesn't resolve alone the underlying problems. Um, you know, so let's just talk about those challenges and problems a little bit, if you like, because first and foremost, from my perspective, spend any time in the US and get underneath the skin of how the system works. And American democracy has been at risk for a very long time. Firstly, the enormous amounts of money there are in American politics is, is distorting and twisting their democratic system. So, you know, the, the people who have most influence in American politics now are not American voters. They're large corporations, they're rich lobby groups like the National Rifle Association and religious organizations and others and sometimes flaky billionaires with their particular interests who plow millions into the American political system. In 2016, $6.4 billion, $6 billion was spent on the November presidential and congressional elections. Now, America has a population five times larger than here in the United Kingdom but it spent 80, eight zero times more on those elections than the UK spent in its general election in 2015. Now, figures for 2020 are preliminary at this stage, but they suggest that even more was spent by a large margin, more than $14 billion. That's 175 times more than the UK spends on a general election, which in effect, although bearing in mind the systems are slightly different, but that brings a head of government stroke state in American terms and a legislature into power. Those numbers are startling and they are a real problem, but they're not the only problem in American democracy. There's a huge amount of political corruption too. There's widespread gerrymandering, gerrymandering of district constituency boundaries. And this is by both parties once they have, this is done at a state level and um, it's done by both parties to try and reduce the chances that they will ever lose a particular district or constituency. There's considerable voter suppression. This is largely by the Republicans uh, at a state level. Again, trying to stop people, usually from minor minority groups who would more likely vote Democrat, trying to deter them from actually casting their vote. So, you know, the US system, the political system in the US, no longer represents the views of the American people in a way that a democracy should. And you can overlay that too with the increasing politicization of uh, decisions over political judicial appointments to the Supreme Court, but many other federal courts too, which, which risks um, really important decisions for American society being taken on the basis of ideology and politics rather than the merits of the case. You know, these are really serious problems that uh, if they're not addressed, will come back to haunt uh, America again in future, I think. Other problems, and I won't dwell on these too, too long in the, given the time we have, but other problems that, that need to be addressed, the economy. The American has had a, an economy that basically over the last few decades had allowed the top 1% to get more and more wealthy while the majority have seen their livelihoods shrink. Uh, and their earning power reduce and the availability of jobs fall. You know, it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that the American dream is but a footnote in history, if you like, for the vast majority of Americans now. Social mobility is lower in America than it is in many parts of Europe, including the UK. So the chances of an American an American born into a lower uh, sort of uh, uh, level family, making their way up to the higher levels of economic wealth and so on, are reducing and increasingly small. On healthcare, for example, the American approach to healthcare leaves millions, millions of people without any healthcare coverage at all. But it also, and this is talked about less, it leaves many more millions underinsured. So when they do need 
tr treatment from a doctor or in hospital, or they are left with bills of thousands of dollars that they somehow have to pay. And it also in massively inflates drug prices so that people die in America because they cannot afford basic drugs that have been around for decades and cost almost nothing in this country because of the drug prices like insulin and so on are so high. Um, there's also, uh, and we heard Joe Biden talk about tackling this earlier, there's also systemic racism in America, American society. That's undeniable. It's the shadow of slavery and it's never genuinely been, been dealt with uh, by American society. And what that means is African-Americans and, and other Americans from minority communities suffer higher levels of unemployment, much higher levels of, of poverty. When they're earning, they're earning considerably less than their white American counterparts. They have poorer health outcomes. They are much more likely to be incarcerated. And if they do get into trouble with the law, they have less access to justice. Uh, and finally, the other thing I would mention is the scourge of gun violence, which kills tens of thousands of Americans every year, both by in, in homicide, but also in suicide and, and, and accidents and blights poorer communities. And despite the fact that consistently for years, the majority of Americans want to see something done about it because of the money and interest that goes into politics from certain groups and individuals, nothing has been done. So, you know, Biden inherits all this um, and, and he inherit, inherits a country that's so much more divided than it was four years ago because of what it has been through over the last four years. So even without um, the coronavirus pandemic and the economic impact that has had on America, it's fair to say uh, that's a pretty big and serious um, uh, intray to have to face. Now, you know, I'm not saying for a moment that Biden is not right to focus on the immediate challenges of the pandemic and the economic challenges America faces as a result of that. That's absolutely right. But I think if America really is to uh, continue to progress, uh, as uh, Biden has said he wants America to do, then in the longer term, they must begin to, to address these much wider, longer standing problems that um, you know, have started to uh, blight America and its ability to develop. You know, it needs to begin to heal um, the divisions at home if it wants to, you know, uh, continue to thrive, if it wants to continue to be the most successful global economy, if it wants to continue to have a role as a global superpower, and if it wants to be a successful beacon of Western democracy, which I believe is vital to the future of the Western system for all of us. Because if these things are not tackled, all it will do is lead to more anger, more fears, more resentment across parts of the American uh, population. And that then is a breeding ground for more populism, for more nationalism. Now, you know, we, it's hard to predict who would come along and feed that uh, uh, you know, breeding ground. It could be another uh, Donald Trump uh, run at the presidency if he's not banned from uh, public office through um, uh, conviction by the Senate. Um, it could be other members of the Trump family or his entourage. Um, Pompeo, um, the uh, former Secretary of State, clearly has political ambitions. Or it could be, um, you know, someone else who's not yet on our radars. But it is a real risk if America doesn't begin to tackle these fundamental challenges that it faces. And, you know, what Trump showed, uh, if he showed anything, is that um, not just Americans, that people around the world are susceptible to populist and nationalist messages, and also how fragile our democracies can be. But let's sort of jump back to the positive side, if you like, because I'd like to finish on a positive note. 
you know, Joe Biden has already talked about these things. He talked about them um, after his inauguration this afternoon. He's talked about them in his transition planning. And that is, he wants his administration to build back better after the pandemic. He wants to tackle systemic racism and growing economic inequality. He wants to tackle the existential threat of climate, climate change. So, you know, I do feel a sense of optimism that his administration will begin to look at these uh, uh, real challenges that America is facing because it's not rocket science why America ended up with someone like Donald Trump. It's pretty plain and obvious now what the causes of that were and that they need to be addressed. Now, you know, so I start with a sense of optimism. Uh, I don't um, I want to, uh, you know, suggest that the challenges are not enormous. They are. They're not going to be easy to deal with. Um, after the um, Georgia Senate runoff elections a couple of weeks ago, the Democrats have a majority in both houses of Congress, which is helpful. But of course, the majority in the Senate is wafer thin. It, re it relies on a couple of independents always voting with the Democrats and no Democrats um, voting against. Um, but, you know, this is actually a, quite a common um, situation to be in in, in American politics. The, the, its system was set up to have these checks and balances. And if you look back over the last 50 years or so, it's only 14 years, I think, where the president in office, uh, their party has had control of both houses of Congress. So for the vast majority of the time, uh, what that means is, is that American presidents have to work across the aisle. They have to seek bipartisan support for their initiatives. And that's going to be no different for Joe Biden. But again, on the positive side, Joe Biden has years of experience on Capitol Hill and as vice president, and he has a reputation for seeking out compromise, for working with his Republican um, counterparts to try and find solutions to problems that everybody can agree to. He's a, you know, he's a consensus builder. Um, and, you know, from the times I have met him, what is really striking is his unique knack of connecting with um, anybody. Um, whether they are foreign diplomats, whether they're young students, whether they're multimillionaire businessmen and so on. He has, he's one of those people who just has that gift of, of connecting with people, understanding their issues and making them feel that they want to work with him. And I think that's uh, a positive. It's also, I think, uh, highly likely that he will be a one-term president. Um, you know, he's 82 already. Um, and so, you know, he's going to be a man who wants to get things done. He will have an eye on his legacy. He will also have an eye on making enough progress so that in four years time, another Democrat will um, uh, get elected as president. So he needs to show something for his presidency. And I think, you know, the fact that America has had the four years of Donald Trump is facing a crisis over the pandemic. I think that does give him some space to be quite bold in what he tries to achieve. Uh, and so, as I say, um, I'm optimistic. There are lots of unknowns out there, of course, including will Donald Trump go quietly? A big question mark. Um, but whatever happens, I am absolutely sure that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will, will be trying to keep looking forward um, and focusing on the positive and the future rather than looking behind them uh, at what Trump may or may not have done to the country. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for that fantastic tour de force description of everything uh, that's been going on. Um, so we now have some time for questions. Um, and um, I, I, Patrick, I hope you'll be able to, to share your video with us so we can see how you, how you respond to them as well as hear you. Um, but what I thought, we've got lots of questions going, please do put them in the Q&A uh, that we have and we'll try to get through as many as we can. But I first actually wanted to invite Bridget, who, who, who's worked with Patrick, so, so knows how to really challenge you, uh, just to ask a, a couple of things. So, so Bridget, two, a couple of questions from you to start us off. 
Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. And you and I have talked a lot about this. Um, so it was really good to kind of hear the in-depth answers that you were giving um, and sharing with the with the audience. So I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions um, from your book as well. So you talked in your remarks and you talk a lot in your book about the kind of national myths of America um, and the you know the difficulties associated with those. I just wanted to quote some um, some of what you wrote back at you and then ask you what that means now um, to Julian's point about a little bit of challenge. Um, so you said during election campaigns, candidates for office draw unashamedly on America's national myths um, to set out how they alone will defend their country's unique strengths once in power or they will return the US to some golden era when its exceptionalism was unquestioned. Um, I think that's unquestionably something that happened in this election. And I suppose my question is, you've talked a bit about Trump in the last kind of four years and how he used some of that American exceptionalism. But the question now I suppose is, what does Biden do with that? Um, because a lot of the messaging that went into this election does go along those lines. And you also share an anecdote about the kind of American exceptionalism um, and Biden's talking about it that you experienced, maybe you want to share that too. But the question is, you know, given the number of the challenges that you've touched on that Biden and his administration face, how does that kind of delivering on that promise um, of, of citing these national myths in the context of the election um, now play out over the next, especially two years before the midterms? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Bridget. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and, and you know, what I, what I argue in the book is that, you know, first and foremost, all countries have national myths. Um, it's part and parcel of every nation state. And, you know, we all know the American ones about the, you know, the most successful capitalist economy and this democracy to which others aspire, et cetera, et cetera. And here in Britain, um, you know, it played into the Brexit referendum too. So we're not immune from this uh, about, you know, how Britain stood alone against um, Nazi Germany in 1940 and without that, you know, and all that that goes with it. So, so America is not unique in having national myths, but I think there is something, and I certainly felt this uh, for spending years in the United States, that there is something about the, the, the routine way in, in which it plays, they play into American politics in a way that they just don't. Um, here in the UK or in other countries that I've lived and served in. Um, and the, the, the risk is the more you keep hearing these national myths about America is the best country in the world, we are the most successful economy, we, mar we are the most productive, we are the most innovative, we are the most wonderful democracy and so on, the more people believe it um, because that's what happens. And, and the risk of that is not that national myths are wrong because they're part of our identity, but it's that it's then easy to overlook real problems that exist because if you continue to believe that everything is excellent and wonderful, those problems can't be that significant. And I, and I, you know, I genuinely think that's why uh, many of these problems haven't been tackled over decades. So. You know, I mean, looking now, bringing it right up to date with the Biden administration, and of course, um, you know, you talked about the anecdote I, um, I mentioned in the book, and and this is when I I met Joe Biden um, at uh, an event in Washington D.C. for a, a small educational charity, and this this organization brings students from all over the world, and indeed from parts of America, and puts them in this. Um, slightly crazy um, uh, uh, 18th century mansion in the middle of Washington DC that looks like sort of Harry Potter British stately home um, and, the, and, it, and it really does and the reason it looks like that is because um, it was built by a successful American businessman man who fell for uh, uh, a young British uh, woman who lived in a place called Haddon Hall in, in Derbyshire, I think, so not that far from here. And um, to woo her to America, he promised to build a, basically a, an English home. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, but the, the meeting with Biden, um, you know, it was an award. This is after he had um, uh, Donald Trump had taken office. And so uh, Biden was the former vice president at this point. And he was receiving an award for his contribution to uh, public service and so on. And, you know, I ended up introducing him um, uh, before he accepted the award and he then spoke. And I was really quite taken aback that Joe Biden 
just went for all the old mythology in what he said about how you know Amer everybody still wants to come to America because you can anybody can make it here if they just work hard, which no longer is true, I'm afraid. It's not very much different to most other Western countries in, in that sort of sense of opportunity. He also said, people want to come here from all over the world because there's no ethnic conflict. Well, whew. I mean, the melting pot myth about America is that, you know, everybody can come to this country and we all live together very happily and it's in, and putting those different cultures together makes us incredibly innovative and, and different. And there's a lot of truth in that, but it also, isn't true for many people from minority groups in the US and certainly not African Americans. And I referred to this in my presentation, how, you know, the numbers, uh, how, how those groups compare with white Americans in terms of wealth and home ownership and health are shocking, really shocking. There are parts of America where child mortality is, is higher than sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, it's, it can be that bad. So I was just taken aback a little, particularly as he was no longer in office. So he didn't have to sort of put on a facade or, or, or as much as he might have done before. So it's just, it just reinforced to me how those myths are everywhere. You know, and it goes as far as country music and, and, and it goes as far as Disney with, you know, Disney heroes are the, you know, are, are all the American dream in, in, in miniature and animation. And, uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with it in many ways, but there is something wrong with it if it stops Americans seeing or more importantly, stops them dealing with real problems that exist in their society. Sounds good. And to be fair, that is the premise of your book. So that was a very well thought out and very long answer. So for the rest of the Q&A, maybe we'll keep it a little bit shorter and I'll keep this question very short. Um, so you talk as well in your book about, you know, arriving into DC and having spent a lot of time in the States, you spent some time there as a student. Um, but you also talk about the fact that you were surprised a little bit um, about how different it was than your expectations. So I'll just read you a little bit and then maybe you can give us shortish answer um, about that, that part of your experience. Um, so you say many British diplomats arrive in America unwittingly unprepared for the differences between the UK and the US democratic systems. Um, and you said that when you arrived, it quickly turned out that none of your experiences over, over almost 30 years had really prepared you um, for living and working in the States at the center of American politics and democracy. So just kind of super quick, because we have 42 questions. Um, what was, you know, just give us a sense of that and what was most surprising, um, and that will help, I think, maybe in some of the questions people have asked already, I've been reading them as, I've been, as we've gone along, and the kind of differences between the UK and the US do crop up. So just give us a quick picture of what most surprised you when you originally arrived in DC. Yeah, and this may, this may say more about me than it says about America, perhaps, but, um, you know, I'd worked with Americans a lot in my career, and so I thought I understood how America works, but it was only when I got there that you really start to understand, or I really started to understand how different the two systems were. And one of the most fundamental differences is here in the UK, and I, you know, this will be obvious to very many people, but, but it, it's sort of what it means. Here in the UK, when we have a general election, the person who is standing to be prime minister is the, the leader of that party. Um, and um, when they win election, if they win, of course, outright, as most often in UK history or recent history, um, uh, governments have, they have a majority in Parliament. And so the Prime Minister, uh, as, as head of the executive, has effective control in the legislature. And so what that means is if, um, you know, at the moment, Boris Johnson, an 80 seat majority, if he wants to do something, unless it's absolutely totally crazy, uh, which will get members of his own party rebelling against that, he will get that through um, Parliament and it will become legislation or whatever it is. You know, that just isn't the way it works in America. And I know that's a statement of the obvious, but you know, it just leads to so much more horse trading in, in, in Washington to get anything done. And, you know, that's how the Constitution designed the American system. It was those checks and balances. Um, but I think, you know, I was still surprised by what that really meant and how hard it made um, uh, it for presidents who we all look at and a, president, a president of the US and think they are super powerful. Well, yes, they are, because they sit atop um, one of the, the richest country in the world and the most powerful military and all that. 
but they don't have that many levers that, as you would expect. Um, they, it's really a battle to get anything done in a way that just doesn't happen in the UK. Fantastic, thanks so much. I think those are my, my yeah. challenge questions, Julian. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, Richard. And we, we've had over 50 questions, so yeah. I'll try to assemble them into some sort of sensible way uh, as far as possible. Can I start off by asking, you know, since, since this is the UK, what does Trump's election mean for the UK? Uh, Boris Johnson had a more complex relationship with Trump and a rather difficult relationship with Biden. We're obviously going through Brexit. What are the consequences directly for us? Um, uh, again, a good question. I think, um, I think a couple of things. One, you know, Biden is a, an experienced professional. Um, he is, uh, I genuinely don't think um, what has gone in the past in terms of how he sees um, uh, our current government here in the UK may have been close to the Trump administration. I don't think that will play for very much, to be honest, in how uh, his administration approaches the UK. Um, he will go about his business in a professional uh, way. And so that's a positive. I don't, you know, he's not going to bear grudges uh, or anything of that sort. Um, but this does link into to the Brexit point you made, uh, and that is, um, you know, with a Trump administration, I think it's fair to say that um, a trade deal would have been a higher priority and was a higher priority for them because, not least because um, Donald Trump and much of his administration were supporters of Brexit. Um, and so, you know, they wanted to be helpful. That will not be the same in the Biden administration. That doesn't mean they won't want to do a tra trade deal with us, far from it. They would love to do a trade deal with us. Um, but, you know, they're not going to rush to do it and they're going to want a trade deal that brings something to America too. Um, it's not going to be a gift, um, not that it ever would have been from a Trump administration either, but, you know, America will want to be able to do more trade with the UK as a result of a trade deal, which will mean that we will need to make compromises about what we are willing to accept or not in, in order to get that. Um, so, you know, in that sense, um, you know, I don't think we have anything to worry about as the United Kingdom in terms of the relationship with Biden. But I do think um, now we will no longer, if you like, be a bridge to Europe because, you know, we, we have been a successful bridge to Europe for the Americans for a very long time because we tend to think in a, in a, in a similar way. And so, for example, if the Americans are trying to impose more sanctions on Russia, let's say, for misbehavior, then we're likely to be sympathetic and we can help convince the Europeans. We don't offer that anymore um, because we're not inside the European Union. And so, you know, there is going to be undoubtedly more Americans going direct to Paris and Berlin and Madrid than there was before. And I think uh, it also means that we will, the UK, we will need to work harder to show what we bring to the table. Um, our historic relationship with the US Will, is worth a lot and will play for a lot, but actually we will ultimately be judged on what we deliver and how we can help America advance what it's trying to achieve in the global stage. So another connection, particularly with the UK, and there's a question that's coming on, on this, um, is the fact that the UK has a habit of copying behaviours from, from the USA. We have UK conversation at the moment about defunding the BBC or changing how that would work and the rise of right-wing radio, radio and TV channels often copying from the US or funded by the US. Um, we have other, other changes in how political campaigning is done where things done in the US are copied here. You talked quite a lot about the polarisation in the US. We'll talk about some of the other consequences of that for US politics. Do you think there's a risk to the UK in becoming ever more Americanized in terms of our media, in terms of uh, and polarization. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, I do think it's a it's a genuine risk, and uh, my hope is that now there has been recalibration in the United States, and we've seen very clearly the consequences of of some of those ways of operating. That that maybe there'll be less of a rush uh, in this country to to follow suit. And you mentioned the media. Um, uh, which is a very important one, I think. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure we, we can, it can always be argued that we follow the United States. If you look at um, uh, our tabloid uh, press here, 
um, Americans have, you know, well, pre-Donald pre Trump would look at that and say, this is sort of a bit crazy um, and um, not very helpful. Now, what America ended up getting was tabloid press and partisan press on cable TV, um, which had even more impact and reach. So, you know, I think this is sort of, it, it comes and goes in both directions. It's not necessarily always um, uh, following the US, but to answer your, your fundamental question, yes, um, I think it is, there are dangers in blindly following some of the things that America's, America has done. And I hope that um, we will think a little bit twice before we do that now. And before we head into the US and, and various other things that are going on there again, We've had quite a lot of questions about various aspects of China. And obviously this is a huge question for Biden. It was a huge issue for Trump. So we've had questions like, you know, how should Biden deal with an increasingly authoritarian China? You know, and from, from my perspective, you know, there's issues like Hong Kong, which has been more of an issue in the UK than there. We have issues about Uyghurs. We have, you know, internal repression. But then you have to set that against, uh, and just to pick up from one of the other questions, the, um, the fact that China is a huge asset to much of the US like it is to the UK, to Ivy League schools, you know, th there are huge financial benefits um, in the UK and in the US. How can Biden to deal with all of these challenges and the rise of China? Yeah, um, again, um, it's, it's not an easy uh, thing to have to, to navigate, it's fair to say, but, um, you know, I think the bottom line is we cannot, as Western powers just sort of try and ignore um, China as it emerges onto the world stage and gets increasingly wealthy and um, is an increasing global player. We have to engage. There's no question about that. So, so I think the, 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 the heart of this issue is how do we engage? Um, and I think, you know, if you, in some ways, if you, you like, we had, um, sort of the David Cameron policy of um, golden eras and you know hug them close and you had the the Trump approach which was penalize them um, uh, harshly or so he thought for you know uh, intellectual um, property theft and so on and put tariffs on. I don't think either are really necessarily the right approach. There has to be somewhere in between where and and, and more importantly actually you need global alliances. China is, you know, incredibly wealthy now, very powerful, a real force on, on the global stage. And if we as the Western world um, want to steer China into behaviours that we think are appropriate, and you, know, you mentioned the Uyghurs, you mentioned Hong Kong, you mentioned, you know, fundamental human rights, and also, um, you know, playing fairly in international trade, the only way that we can um, influence China is acting together. So that, you know, China is faced with not just Donald Trump firing off tariffs or not just um, uh, David Cameron hugging him close, that you, that you build a coalition of countries who agree and say, China, this behavior is a step too far. You need to uh, uh, do something different, or these will be the consequences. So you know, it's a it's it's a difficult difficult balance to achieve. But but I think Biden will take that sort of globalist approach and try to work together with allies to to uh, navigate a tricky path. It will be fascinating. So, and just as a, as a brief plug, we have a number of events coming up here at Jesus College through our China Centre, uh, including uh, Oliver Letwin uh, speaking about. Um, what we might be able to do, whether we could avoid a war with China, and there's lots of other things on that particular subject. But I would quite like to move into the US now. So um, can we start off by looking at the, the state of the different parties um, mm -hmm. and, and these constant calls for unity? So first, actually, just I, I, there, there was a, a, an interesting comment here from, from an American. It's, I, I'd love to know how many nationalities we have among the couple hundred people here, but I suspect it's a lot. Um, Unity, wonderful idea. But the question from it here is, is it not naive and likely more damaging in the long term to seek unity with avowed white supremacists and domestic terrorists, as well as those who those who've willingly and knowingly enabled them? It does that just go too far? <laughs> um, well, I, I think I, I, <laughs> I would immediately push back on that and say, I, I don't think Joe Biden was saying, um, uh, I want to ally myself with white nationalists or unify myself with white nationalists. 
or, or, or supre white supremacists and, and those who have enabled them. I think, you know, um, uh, there's a huge middle ground in America, despite the polarization. Um, you know, it is, th th there's loads of um, uh, research on this, as, as you will know, and the Pew Research Foundation do some fascinating stuff on this and, and how, how America has become increasingly polarized. But notwithstanding that, there are the vast majority of Americans are not on those extremes, left or right. They're not the sort of um, crazy socialists, as uh, Donald Trump would claim. We can have a discussion about that separately. Um, um, or, or white um, supremacists. They're somewhere in between. And so, and yet, you know, lots of those, millions of those voted for Donald Trump, um, despite everything that he brought over four years that we've talked about. So there's that body, if you like, more in the center who I think, you know, Biden is reaching out to. And indeed, you know, on a on a business level in his trying to make progress in in Congress with legislation, it's those people. It's not the people on the crazy fringes. It's the people somewhere in between that he needs to reach out and win over because they, they may well be won over if they can see mutual interest in a policy proposal in a way that the extremes aren't going to be. So I think that's what he means about unity. All societies have the sort of extreme fringes, and it's probably fair to say that they are bigger now uh, after four years of Trump and what social media does to society than they were in the past, and, and you can't ignore them. But that unity is around everybody else, I think, and, and hoping that that has a, has a slowly filters into those more extremes as well and peeling people away from them. So we've had questions about splits on the right and this new party Donald Trump may or may not set up. Um, but it's probably a bit short time. Can I, can I plant that for a bit? I think you've addressed that in terms of, uh, I suspect you'd be cynical about an extreme fringe right wing party succeeding. Can I pick up though the splits on the left? Because the Democrats, um, are not completely united. I can't remember who it was who said that they're not a member of any organized uh, party, they're, they're a member of the Democratic Party. Um, uh, and, and there's a number of challenges there. How do you think Biden will manage to tackle those, both with the left who are the progressives, who are maybe annoyed about him and some of the things he wants to do, but also the people um, who are have huge resentment against the Republicans and would like to punish the Republicans for their actions. How can he hold all these different ideas together? Um, well, I think first and foremost, on the left, if you like, of the Democratic Party, the progressives, um, I think um, they will feel like very many people, a huge relief that we're not facing four more years of Donald Trump, um, that there is a Democrat in the White House. And, you know, um, the, the, the team that Biden has put together um, is, is one of the most diverse administrations or will be one of the most diverse administrations when they're all um, confirmed uh, that America has ever had. And so, you know, there's, there's nods to progressives in, in that sense. And, but I genuinely think, you know, they're going to give him a bit of space. They're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. They don't want to be the ones scuppering his plans. I mean, why would you do that? I mean, they, they want him to be successful and they'll want, of course, to convince him to move to the left towards them. But, you know, I do actually think that although, you know, there's huge amounts of debate about this, about how progressive Biden is and, you know, he's rather centrist uh, for the liking of, of many on the left of the Democratic Party. I think he is going to choose a course that is further to the left um, than Barack Obama, which will go some way to satisfying what they are looking for, I think. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, but, but I think the, the most um, significant reason, if you like, is that you know, America is in the middle of a, a significant crisis from the pandemic and then overlaid with four years of Trump and all the divisions. So he needs to do something quite significant to sort of right the ship. He's not going to right the ship by just moving slightly one direction. They've got to do much something more significant than that. And so, you know, I think we will see him trying to do something genuinely on healthcare, for example, um, uh, because there is a realization in the middle of a global pan pandemic that um, uh, that the sort of rather um, uh, sort of 
fr fractured system that the Americans have when many people don't have access to healthcare at all is not, not great. So I think you will see something on there, which will again nod towards the progressives. You'll see something on systemic racism, um, which will be a nod towards the progressives. So I don't see him having too much of an issue, certainly not in the early years of his, his, his tenure. Um, uh, and, you know, trying to win over Republicans and, and punishing Republicans. Oh, uh, yes, I think, you know, there is going to be a lot of frustration and, and you know, it's looking back, people will want to, uh, 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 make Republicans, uh, you know, Donald Trump himself, of course, pay for what he did um, uh, and, you know, um, convict him in his impeachment trial and indeed um, uh, see the Republicans who never distance themselves from him um, uh, reap the consequences. But, you know, as long as Biden is making progress with his legislative agenda and as long as people keep looking forward, I think that will fade into the distance a little bit. Um, actually, um, it, not least because Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will not want people focusing on Trump for, for any moment longer than they have to over the impeachment trial, for example. So they'll want to be focusing on everything other than Donald Trump. So, you know, I think, I hope that will go away. So when you look at the US from the UK, there's a lot of things which seem very strange. We've had questions about, about many of them, about sort of you know, gun laws and, and climate uh, fi campaign finance laws and various other things. But can I just pick up a word socialism as a question about this? Um, because if one were to propose something like Obamacare in the UK, it would be roundly decried as a far right wing idea because it was so far away from the sort of health care that we expect. Um, and yet in the US, it, it, it's considered a pretty extreme position. Uh, we could talk about lots of these, but why is that word socialism such a powerfully toxic phrase for so many in the US? And, and what can be done to change the way that those words, words like liberalism and various other things, are, are used there and understood? Um, it's a poisonous word because um, uh, those um, peddling the term socialism as, uh, as a uh, criticism um, are not really talking about socialism and they have successfully changed the definition of the word. So when, you know, Donald Trump, um, you know, fired up his, his, his supporters talking about socialism, he wasn't really talking about socialism or, or, or left-wing politics. He was talking about, you know, in the putting into the minds of people the worst um, uh, uh, challenges faced by the communist system and, you know, those sort of, you know, failing economies of uh, you know, pre-1989 and, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's what he's really put into people's minds. But it's not just Donald Trump. Um, you know, for years and years, um, I, I caught a fascinating um, uh, uh, podcast recently about healthcare in the US and how um, this is not just politicians doing this, but the, the, the healthcare uh, sector, the commercial interest behind healthcare and their, you know, um, their business organizations have been peddling adverts on American TV for decades, suggesting that, you know, if anybody moves towards any form of universal healthcare, that means your hospitals will have, you know, water running from the ceiling and no oxygen and they'll be rife full of disease. And if you go there, you'll get sick. And, and you know, they've, they've been peddling those um, uh, those uh, stories for a very long time. So, you know, socialism in America is so toxic because they've redefined the word. Um, and, you know, what's crazy about this is, is what, what you said, and that is that, you know, even the, the progressives on the left of the Democrat Democratic Party in the US, if they came and put the, their, their policies on a platform um, in Europe, they'd be seen as centre centre left and and normal. They wouldn't be seen as left wing at all. So you know, America has become completely skewed in its its views of this, and it's going to take a long time for for uh, that to be overcome. I think um, we're beginning to run out of time, and we still have ever more questions flooding in. Uh, wonderful questions about about disability rights, about actually what do you do about about race, about the relationship with the UN. I can't fairly pick between all of them, so I'm not going to fairly pick between all of them, but ask you about climate. How mm. grateful should, should the climate be about this election? 
you know, some things come and go, the climate crisis is huge and with us for a while. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's a good positive step forward, you know, to bring America back on board and not just back on board, but, um, you know, Biden is clearly very committed to this. Um, uh, and, you know, the language he's been using about existential threat and, you know, and in, in his speech this afternoon about the, the, the grave challenges uh, we all face because of the climate, that's a positive. Um, it brings him back into the mainstream, uh, you know, certainly international fold in the West. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, we're going to solve the climate crisis overnight, unfortunately. Um, it's a very good start and a much needed start, but we still have China, which is growing economically and it's committed first and foremost to raising the wealth of its country and it's using lots of coal and, and you know, even uh, countries like Australia uh, are hardly uh, pro action on climate change, the current government there. So there's a lot of work to be done to shift the dial um, on this, um, but, you know, with America uh, fully committed and using all the leverage it can bear, we have mu much more chance of doing something than we have done for the last four years. So that's got to be a good thing. Fantastic. So, so the final question, um, as I said, four years ago, we had a very traumatized college community trying to come to grips with what happened, trying to understand how somebody like Hillary Clinton could lose to somebody like Donald Trump. We've just we're now in the position we are now in four years time, you know, maybe you can join us again, maybe, you know, who, who knows. But if you were looking into your crystal ball now and saying what would happen in four years time on Inauguration Day, would we be looking at President Trump? And, and, and if so, which one uh, will we be looking at a, a second term for Biden? You suggested not. If not, what do you think is going to happen? Who will who will be being inaugurated in four years time? Hmm. Um, well, I'm going to end, end um, on an optimistic note, I think, and say um, I definitely don't think it will be another Trump. I don't think it will be Donald Trump. I don't think it'll be uh, members of his family. I think, um, uh, you know, particularly if um, uh, they um, don't get a mainstream voice again through social media very quickly, um, they won't be able to mobilise their base in the same way. And indeed, they probably... Um, will want to make lots of money um, and so they will be focused elsewhere and indeed who knows Donald Trump um, may be uh, tied up for several years with court cases because um, even though at a federal level uh, it may be the case that once the sort of um, uh, the trial in the Senate is over that the that, that Biden-Harris administration want to move on that's not going to stop the terrier-like um, prosecutors in New York or elsewhere for pursuing Donald Trump as they've been doing for the last few years so um so you know he may well be tied up so i don't think it'll be a trump um on the democrat side i think it will be another democrat it probably won't be biden himself but who knows it depends you know his health and his um uh desire at, at, at that point to stand again um but you know you know this uh, about the american system it's almost impossible to predict who will stand at this stage because you know, here in the UK, you have your party leader, your party leader is the figurehead, that's the person who become prime minister. That That is both a, a weakness and a strength in the US. It's a weakness in, in, in the sense you talked about sort of, a, you know, the Democrats and not being very united because they don't always have that figurehead to hold, try and hold them together and have party discipline. Um, but it all, it does mean that in three years time, two years time, when they start thinking about the next election, um, all sorts of people can put themselves forward and come out of the woodwork. And it could be a longstanding politician. It could be a businessman. Um, who knows? So it's hard to predict. But as I say, I'm going to stay optimistic. I think it will be another Democrat. I think uh, Biden will have made progress on some of the more fundamental issues I've talked about. And I think um, the American people will be willing to give the Democrats another four years at that point. Fantastic. Patrick, it's been an amazing presentation. You, you've, there's been really rich content. You've covered so much ground. We could keep you, I think, for another three or four hours going through everything and all the questions that are arising. Um, what I would say to, to people who are listening, buy the book. If you want to have much more of this, buy the book and you'll get a much longer is there. But Patrick, thank you so very, very much uh, for joining us. It's really been a great pleasure to have you with us. 
Um, everybody who's attended, um, sorry for those questions I didn't manage to get to. We will be sending out a feedback form and I, I hope you'll fill it in. And I also hope that you'll come along to some of our other events. Follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, sign up to our mailing list, look on Eventbrite. We hope to see you for other events. You don't have to wait for four more years. Patrick, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you again for in, in inviting me. It was, it, was, it was great fun and really um, uh, a really fun conversation. So thank you and thank you to everybody for, for their incredible questions.